but as the unofficial PR guy for Chat Row, we have a little bit of a controversy going on in here. We have um, – have you heard of The Crawling, Dan? Are you familiar? Basically, uh, Nick Lovin's wife crawling right now across the screen last week. Anything on that? Uh, I think – What was it your wife who crawled through the screen or your daughter? It was my wife. Your wife – she was crawling behind me. Well, we can see the. Off... <laughs> I know. Just tell her to walk past. It's. A... I know. I know. It was. Uh... Did you see it yet? Because I've only uh, seen stills. I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want to embarrass Sarah. So oh, I. No, she she laughed at. Me. Okay. Fine. Yeah, Paul. It looked like an episode of Dateline where. It's the last thing he ever saw. Because there's like a woman <laughs> crawling in the background, and he's not McLeod is nonchalantly he's talking sports yeah. on his webcam. This was the last <laughs> image we ever saw of him. Uh, the commissioner of Major League Baseball, it would have been opening day today, gave his scenarios for the 2020 season. We'll have that for you coming up. The Cowboys and Dak Prescott are chatting again. You know what's amazing? I told you a couple of weeks ago, a source said Dak wants a three-year deal because Dak wants to capitalize on three years at about $34, $35 million, then go back into the marketplace and get another big deal. So he wants to get a three-year, and then he wants his five-year deal, not the other way around because who knows what that salary is going to be for a starting quarterback, an elite quarterback by then. He wants three years. Cowboys offered five. Now they've budged and gone to four. That's why the Cowboys and Dak Prescott's agent are talking again. At least that's what I was told. But I think Dak will settle at three or four years at $35 million probably. And then he'll be back in the marketplace to get another deal. But he wanted three. And now it looks like he'll move up to four. But the Cowboys and Dak Prescott are chatting. Uh, let me see. A couple of things that I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, I mentioned it's supposed to be opening day for Major League Baseball, and all 30 teams were on the schedule. And it would have been great to see Max Scherzer versus Jason DeGrom, Mookie Betts, his debut with the Dodgers. Instead, the season is suspended indefinitely because of the coronavirus. Now, keep in mind, baseball played a full schedule even during World War II. But now you had a lot of uh, players who uh, signed up for the military. Uh, Ted Williams famously did. Bob Feller. I mean, there were a lot of great players who signed up, and they were actually in combat. They were in battle. Uh, that's when Joe Nuxall became the youngest player to ever play in a Major League Baseball game. He was 15 years, nine months, uh, the left-hander. But they, they continued to play baseball during World War II, but that gives you an idea of how devastating this pandemic is affecting sports. And even if baseball is in the true national ba uh, pastime, the symbolism of opening day is really important because, you know, it's the start of spring. It signifies hope and optimism. And every team feels like, hey, we got a chance maybe this year. And hopefully Major League Baseball will be able to salvage something this year. And if not, we'll look forward to next year. But baseball has been resilient, very resilient. You know, they survived a lot of scandals here. There was the cocaine scandal back in the uh, 70s and 80s. You had the player strikes. You had steroids. We've been through a lot with Major League Baseball. But the dis this disrupt disruption is uh, tough on everybody, including the word disruption. But uh, hope and optimism will return, not only in baseball, but in the real world as well. Good morning, Rick. How are you, Dan? How's I'm doing everybody great. there with your crew? Well, I've got uh, Fritzy at home, McLovin at home, Seton at home. Paulie is here in the man cave, and uh, we have a couple other people uh, behind the scenes and making this possible. How about you? We are uh, thrilled that you're making it possible. My crew is uh, getting a little testy, but uh, we've had never had this kind of family time, and we're going to make the most of it. <laughs> Damn it, you're going to enjoy my company. All right, let me talk a little bit of football, because you know as much about quarterbacks as anybody. And I, I'm curious, are you still all in on Joe Burrow, number one to the Bengals? All in. Okay. All in. No reason to uh, deviate from that. The kid uh, was fantastic, and he did it as much with his mind as with his body. I know there are going to be people that pick apart his arm strength and things that uh, 
that maybe he's not as physically menacing as some of the other quarterbacks that have uh, gone on to greatness, but uh, this guy can flat do it. And I think uh, the Bengals are going to be thrilled to have him. If you're the Dolphins and you love Joe Burrow, which that's Todd McShay says there's no doubt, there's no question, they love Joe Burrow, and you have the picks, how valuable is Joe Burrow if you're the Dolphins? What would you be willing to give up if you're the GM? Well, there's no question that he's worth the price. The question is, how far do you have the distance between Burrow and Tua Tungabailoa? Because if you like uh, both those kids, you can get, I think, Tungabailoa for a much less lesser price than you can get uh, Burrow just by going up to the third spot there and, and getting Detroit's pick. Uh, I know the Redskins are going to try to, you know, dance around and make people think that they're interested in a quarterback, but I think uh, they're got, they've got to go chase young uh, and, and give Dwayne Haskins a chance. Uh, they went and got Kyle Allen from Carolina to, to ease the, the pressure on uh, Haskins. But uh, I, I think the price for uh, Burrow going to one will be too expensive and it's too risky for the Bengals, especially with an Ohio kid in Joe Burrow. I think the Bengals have to go with Burrow. I think uh, the action will start in that three and four spot with the Lions picks and the Giants picks. Do you think the Dolphins go up to make sure they get to it? They have to. They won't get anybody uh, at five. I think uh, Herbert and Tua will go at three and four. Really? I think I think you have to go there. You can't risk, unless you're in love with Jordan Love. Uh, no pun intended. Unless you're. That's too that, high, though, it, isn't it, Rick? I agree. I agree. I I I don't trust that guy. He threw 17 interceptions in his last year. Uh, when he's supposed to be even more mature and more experienced and so forth. So uh, I, I think you have to go. I think the, the catbird seats are, are the Lions and the Giants. Th- those, those are going to be quarterbacks taken at three and four, in my mind. You sold on Justin Herbert. I am. You know, that guy is a big-time talent. Uh, there's some small ball stuff that he has to work on, meaning that he's got to be natural throwing the ball out into a the flat to a running back. He's got to be able to drop it off to a swing route and be able to control what's a howitzer of a throwing arm. But he's brilliant. Uh, He had the highest grade point. I mean, he won the academic Heisman. He stayed for four years and ran for three touchdowns in the, uh, in the Rose bowl. Uh, A year ago, I was watching him against Stanford. He was 25 at 27 in regulation. I think the guy has everything and he's the one guy when we sit and talk about the quarterbacks that didn't have the bevy of just brilliant wide receivers. We're not talking about any of his wide receivers being first rounders. Uh, So, and he lost his tight end uh, midway through the season, his kind of security blanket. So I think this guy's uh, the real deal. But that's when we're talking to Rick Neuheisel, former college coach and a great college football analyst for CBS. That's, and I've spoken to a a few uh, NFL and college people and a a scout as well. How hard is it to assess just how great Tua and Burrow are given that they have first round talent at wide receiver and multiple first round talents at wide receiver? That's the $64,000 question because these guys had every weapon known to man at their disposal. I mean, they really did the yards after catch for these two teams and these two quarterbacks are off the charts. Uh, but I, I, I lean towards Burrow here because Burrow was given so much more autonomy at the line of scrimmage uh, from Ensminger and Joe Brady, and they gave him the keys to the castle. He was allowed to change run to pass, pass to run. He was allowed to change protections. I just think his mind uh, is that further along, not that it's superior because I don't think they ask that much of Tua given the RPO nature of their offense. Uh, but uh, I, I just believe that Burrow is the most ready for NFL play quarterback we've seen in recent memory. Could you fix Jameis Winston? Yeah, it, it, Jameis has to want to be fixed. Jameis has every throw. Jameis has every ability to play this game at the highest, highest level. We saw that over uh, the time in college and certainly some of the time here in the NFL, what he has shown the inability to do is learn from previous mistakes. You know, an interception is okay. If we don't do it again, 
But to do it over and over again, uh, as he has done with the numbers, shows that he's not taking the coaching as to what to steer clear from. And, and to me, and you look at his off-field personality, it kind of shows the same thing. He hasn't necessarily realized that some of the stuff he's done before is beyond sophomoric, right? You, you have to be able to go to the next level. If he takes the next step and says, coach me, coach me a little harder, and I'm going to respond to it, then there's no question I think he can be fixed. Before we get to your song, if you were going to take a risk or take a chance on Cam Newton, Jameis Winston, or Andy Dalton, who are you signing up for? I go Jameis in that. In that, you know, listen, Andy Dalton is a safe road, right? It's like the paved road. You're not going in potholes and all that stuff. I'm not sure what the upside is, and I, given where he is in age, I'm not sure how long he lasts. Cam, to me, is that was a, was a beautiful, beautiful player, but when the legs go. So does the whole product because the legs force teams into different fronts, eight man fronts. You got single high. All of a sudden he was a great thrower, but you needed his legs to complete the package. I'm not sure given the, uh, the beating up that he's taking over the course of his career, he's at that point. So uh, Jameis to me would be the guy that I would lean on, but it would take a long conversation and understanding that we have to get better with uh, these mistakes that have uh, plagued his career. Coronavirus has an impact on college football coaches worried about the schedules, being able to start the off-season workouts, get ready for uh, the season. Do you think there's a date that would make you nervous if you're a college coach of trying to get your team ready and having a full college season schedule? You know, and the other thing that they're worried about, uh, having talked to a couple of guys, Dan, is they're worried about their guys getting their grades. You know, they, these kids all have to still take their classes. And they're doing it in, you know, off of computers at home where sometimes the Wi-Fi is substandard and so forth. So to make sure that everybody's getting what they need academically is one of the biggest concerns for the coaches right now. Making sure that they're, you know, we have people on our staff to make sure guys are going to class and getting up in the mornings and so on and so forth. Uh, that is no longer in place. So that's one of the big concerns. I don't think they're worried about missing spring football. Okay. I know that they are looking forward to having some sort of a mini camp, uh, maybe a two week period over the course of the summer when it becomes safe to do so. Uh, and, and I think everybody will be fine. As a matter of fact, I think there are some guys who would give, give way to spring football over the, over the course of uh, the regular school year anyway for a couple of weeks in the summer when the freshmen who are coming to join the class are all there. Spring football right now is usually with about 60 bodies. And those you go through those bodies pretty quickly if you're trying to get much accomplished. So uh, let everybody kind of recuperate that time during that time and, and make uh, spring ball more of a summer a uh, couple of weeks. I think people would buy into that in a big way. Michael, how are you doing? Dan, I'm good. How are you hanging in there? How's the home situation? Um, well, you know, it's a little different, I think, than most people that, uh, that may be experienced, and it's back east. I'm, I'm in Arizona, and, um, you know, you, you, you just seeing the sun for me is different than the first few days of this when I was back, when I was back east in D.C. and even in Chicago. Just seeing the sun and having the warmth, and, you know, who knows? There's certain, I've certainly talked to people, uh, to medical experts who, who said that one of the reasons people kept talking about in their community keep talking about uh, May, June, is that, you know, these viruses historically, I mean, even the worst ones have been seasonal, which is why they use the word seasonal before virus. And they're hoping that that plays a part, sun and warmth. And so that's not necessarily why I'm here, but it's a whole lot better than being in, you know, 40 degrees in the rain and just the depression and the reality of what we're dealing with right now. So I'm here. Uh, it's been going well, and uh, we're doing some segments of the show uh, every day. I have a studio, which is otherwise essentially empty. I mean, you just don't see anybody, even though I'm sure it's not empty. And now, um, it's, been, it's, it's worked well. And when do you guys think that you'll be back on the air on Pardon the Interruption? Dan, you know what? It, it, it hasn't come up, like, when we might uh, do the show as, as it has existed for 18-plus years. 
as opposed to doing segments uh, of the show on Sports Center. It has not. I haven't asked. I mean, I'm sure it's come up with, with the big bosses. You know how that works. I have not asked. I'm happy to be doing um, the amount of the show that we're doing now. I know that's where we are for this week, and I would suspect next week. But beyond that, I, I don't know because I don't know. You know, so much is determined by what companies feel comfortable with their employees doing, with their staff doing. And that stuff's way above me. And I, I just don't. There's, you know, to to speculate on it, even to ask it. Like, hey, guys, what are we – well, we're going to get back to the show. Nobody knows, and so I just don't concern myself with it at this point. Not yet. He's Michael Wilbon, the co-host of Pardon the Interruption, also covering the NBA for ABC and the Mothership. What do you think of the NFL draft uh, going on as scheduled here next month? Well, you know, Dan, we, we talked about this, Tony, that I did yesterday, and I, I guess I think I'm okay with it. What I'm not okay with is why general managers saying we can't finish our psychological profiling. You know, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't need to hear that we can't have our 11th visit with somebody to ask them if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be in the middle of this? There's context to everything. <laughs> um, does the show have to go on if you're the NFL? I guess it doesn't. I mean, look, it, it, every, it, this is an exception to everything we know in our lives. I mean, maybe there's like, you know, three people alive who can remember the end of World War One. Probably not, actually. I, I looked it up the other day. My, my son asked me, he said, Dad, is there anybody alive who's around for the Spanish flu? And I said, well, let's look it up. And we found a couple people who were amazingly 116. But this is an exception we that no one on earth knows anything about. And so if the league wants to go on with this, I I, I I'm okay with it. I'm not offended by it. Um, if they said, you know, like everything else, we're going to push this a little bit, I'd be okay with that too. This isn't one of those things that has me agitated like some other things that are going on during this. Yeah, as long as you can do your job. And I, I had a source say, you know, these executives, these scouts, GM saying, hey, I can't do my job. He said, remember when Cleveland moved to Baltimore, they had no time to do any interviews and their first two draft picks with Ozzie Newsom were two Hall of Famers in Jonathan Ogden and Ray Lewis. Oh, that's a great point. And he said if you do your job the entire year, then you should yeah. be ready to have a draft tomorrow. If you've done your job, you should be able to you know, conduct your draft, your war room tomorrow. So Yeah, but I agree with that, Dan. You know, I mean, these guys are so – I don't even want to say prepared. I mean, yes, if you've done your job all year. And they, I mean, how many times are they going to look at a guy? How many times do they have to have him in? Under, under normal conditions, um, okay, fine, you tolerate it. But, but to say that, that that has to happen this year, well, we can't have a draft right now, and you push it, push it to win. And how do you know you're going to get that chance? And look, and I understand being able to just give someone a simple physical, but – in most of these cases, I suspect we're not talking about that. We're talking about the extreme lengths to which teams and their personnel evaluators go. And it, we just I don't have the stomach to hear excuses about that right now. All right, a couple of things here. I, I said I wasn't going to get mad anymore. I watched the opening night when they had the brackets for the greatest college basketball player of all time. Oh, God. Oh, God. And, and I don't know if I've been this upset, truly upset on this show. And all of a sudden, I saw where Zion moves moves on past Danny Manning. Shaq moves on. Right, that was that. That was the night he got me. But then Shaq over Lou Alcindor. Jerry West is a 13 seed. Maravich is a 13 seed. Trey Young had half a great season at Oklahoma. Like what? What happened here? This is this is these are the generations we've we've raised. There's two generations of people now who have no regard or interest in history. None. None. We need to do you a correction I mean? show. We need to do, let's look, just call it get I'd off my lawn. Let's get off my I, lawn. I'd be <laughs> I'd be fine with you know. So the, it's so funny. Obviously, you and I have not talked since this started. So the night that, um, first of all, I, I'm just angry about it anyway. Don't put together a bracket that has women and men. Have a have a women's bracket, women's field, and a men's. Don't ask Cheryl. Don't ask whether Cheryl Miller is better than Bill Walton or whatever. I mean, it's just just don't do it. It's just it's lazy. 
And I, I hated it. I hate it. And the nicest Zion was advanced past Danny Manning. No one knows what Danny Manning did, Dan. <laughs> yeah. So, so my, my son, who so all we've done is we've been in the same house for I don't know how many days. It's fight about it's, it's been good. It's been fun. It's fight about sports and history. And he came to me in a proud moment yesterday on his 12th birthday. And he said, Dad, if I, I guess it's Madden he's playing. I don't know. I don't play any video games. <laughs> he said, Dad, if I have Deacon Jones on my defensive line, I go, yes. I just started <laughs> screaming, yes, yes. How did you even come yeah. about his name? And he comes back to me later and he goes, okay, Dad, I, 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 get, I get what you're saying. So if I have Joe Green and Deacon Jones, I go, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. There's no plus yardage play against you if you have them. And I'm screaming at him because, you know, the uh, 70% of the time, or, you know, or maybe not with him, he's pretty good at this age, but he'll come to me and say, so is so-and-so going to the Hall of Fame? And it's like, you know, it's some player who I've almost forgotten about who just happens to play now. And we've got two generations of people who don't know anything and they don't care. And you can't talk them out of it. It's They're like, not listening. They don't care about it. And Dan, it's not just sports. I guarantee you they don't know in World War I. And they'll just say, I don't care. God, I'm Spanish, fluent, whatever. I don't, I, that happened before I was born. Well, and it's so it, angering. I, I have three daughters, so we don't talk sports. But when they talk music and they'll say, hey, Dad, I was wondering about Bowie. I get yes, yes, whatever you're wondering about. It's great. You know, hey, you know, what's your favorite Zeppelin song? What? Yeah, yeah, all of them, you know, just listen to them. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, and I brought this up a couple of weeks ago, I think. I was talking about the most impactful. I guess I was talking about Luel Sindor, and I, because he's the greatest college basketball player of all time. It's not even a question. And I said, you know, there were a couple of impactful games in my life, college basketball games, Texas Western beating Kentucky. So you had your first all black starting five with Don Haskins at Texas Western magic and bird, but also Lou Alcindor against Elvin Hayes in the Astrodome. Those are the three games that I had, I think have, and maybe I'm missing one have had the biggest impact on the sport because the first all black starting five, wins the title against an all-white Kentucky team. Bird Magic, the highest-rated college basketball game. But prime, basketball was in prime time in the Astrodome with Lou Alcindor against Elvin Hayes and the Houston Cougars. So is there another one you'd put in there? And if not, out of so those three. Mind, I share that with you. Um, I'm going to say maybe, I mean, the anniversary, I think it's today, Bill Walton, 21 of 22. Bill, Bill Walton... That game that he that he had, I'm going to put that up there. But also, but Magic that, Bird that, is that one, anniversary today. Oh wow! Well, the, the, that one, the first one, the one I mentioned, Walton, is less culturally impactful than the one you mentioned, which is why I'm with you on your selection of those three. Um, the the the, the Leitner, the Hill to Leitner game doesn't. It wasn't in the final four for one, but it doesn't have the cultural impact. Although it to me. That still has a certain, um, a certain importance, a certain glamour. That's the best game ever played. That's the best, enjoy. best college game ever played. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll put that up. There. Dan, what about uh, the, the the David Thompson game? To that be, was a semifinal it, game against UCLA. It was a semi. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It wasn't the title. And you know what else? I'll give you one other. And I don't. This, this is my privilege of now. This is now for me being old. How about going over Georgetown? I wasn't as surprised that Villanova won that as everybody else. I wasn't as surprised either because they played two close games in the regular. I was a Georgetown beat writer that year. Yeah. And I covered every Georgetown game. And I remember before the game, my we were getting, the Washington put together a book on Georgetown season immediately after. Like, stay up all night the next two nights. You're gonna <laughs> and my editor, I called my editor just before the tip and I said, so what happens when Villanova beats Georgetown? Like, what are you talking about? And I said, do you, you realize that one of the games was like double overtime in a regular season and the other game was like three points? And Villanova couldn't win this game. And I was watching the games on the mothership before they used to play. That was a new thing. And I asked Ed Pinckney after the game, when did you really think you could beat Georgetown? He goes, I'm sitting around in the hotel 
and I see the games we played. He's like, oh, my God, we nearly beat them twice. <laughs> and it was the same feeling. Like, no one, everybody called it the biggest upset except, you know, there were hints that this wasn't going to be <laughs> that necessarily a big upset. But yeah, I'm with you on, on, on those, Dan. Those are the, the Hall of Fame moments in college basketball, which if you think you know about the sport and you're not familiar with those, you need to shut up and go to YouTube or wherever you go and, and, and seek them out and learn about the, the moments that shaped college basketball. It's good to talk to you. Keep yelling at people to get off your lawn, Mike. <laughs> it's good to hear your voice. Thank Stay you, safe. Mike. That's Michael Wilbon, co-host part of the interruption. Of course, covers the NBA as well. Okay, we are walking through the office doors, through the living room. Quick shot of uh, the upstairs steps. There you go. And we're coming around the bend. And we are in the family room. There's a little three-season room outside. I'm curving around back towards the office. There's the, uh, there's the setup right there. How about that? And now we are going to go out the door. See what's cooking, literally and figuratively. And there's the grill. There's the hot dog buns. Let's see what's going on in here. Oh, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, we got some hot dogs going. We got some chicken going. I'm not sure how much long I'm supposed to keep it on there before I burn it all together. But uh, I'm excited. And we are going to have a nice feast, taking you around the uh, backyard a little bit. Oh, that's a whole other story. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's done just yet. Oh, you just want to see me mess up with the tongs. Okay, we can do that. Hang on. Got the tongs, which I'm usually not very good at. All the way through, Todd. They're, they're, they're not ready just yet. Because I, I decided Wait, to you had before. three hours. I know. I, I started cooking it about a half hour ago, and then I realized that by adding the chicken... It just threw off all the times, but I think I know what I'm doing. I have it like at 275, and there it is. I know how to use tongs. <laughs> they're not ready just yet, but they're getting there. But the chicken, I put some uh, teriyaki sauce on it, and I put some garlic on it, and we'll dip it over a little bit here. Are you familiar with the word salmonella? This is the best I can do. Yeah, I, I, those aren't cooked all the way through there, Tyler. Not yet. I think it's going to be a little while, but... It's going to be a lovely lunch for the family, and I don't want to give anybody any kind of poison by eating raw meat. But we are going to get there. I think it's a, it's going to be it's going to be good. I'm excited. And I'm trying to burn myself as I close this. That grill looks really new. <laughs> How many times have you used that grill? I have used that grill. I'm going to say over under five. I'm going under by two. I think a, the. Uh, Something in the over under of three and a half would have been the way to go. Okay. Yeah. I think I've used it somewhere between three and four times. Okay. But this is going to be a special occasion, and we're going to have a meat Thursday, and I'm trying not to kill anybody. We do have to make sure the food is cooked so we don't have to rush anybody to the hospital and I want everybody to stay safe. Okay. Okay. I'm going to shut my phone up and then go back to my lap. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Oh, yeah. Uh-